Welcome to the Judson Road Church of Christ YouTube channel. My name is Caden Lunt, and I will be the one presenting your lesson today. This is part two of a series uh, I have started called Jesus is More Than Your Friend. The first lesson, titled The Seed, we looked at Jesus as the fulfillment of the seed promise. Today, we are looking at Jesus as fulfillment of the Messiah. Uh, we're going to look at what this Messiah is, or what the idea of the Messiah is, what the Jews thought the Messiah would be, and then ultimately what Christ, the Messiah, is and how he fulfills this role of the Messiah. So we're going to dive right on in. Uh, what is the Messiah or what does the word mean? The original Hebrew word means anointed one. Um, so it's generally referring to three different things. These are kings, priests, and prophets. I want you to keep this in the back of your mind because when we see how Jesus is this Messiah and is this anointed one, we're going to look at it through these three roles and how Christ fulfills all three roles and is this Messiah. The word is used 39 different times in the biblical text. Um, not all of these are references to Jesus or this greater idea of the Messiah as a whole. Uh, we're going to look at a couple examples. Um, first one is about priests and prophets. 1 Kings 19.1 and Leviticus 4.3. The one I'm going to read for you is Leviticus 4.3. So if you want to turn over there, go right ahead. I'm going to explain the 1 Kings one real quick. 1 Kings, uh, the context for that passage is Ahab has just killed um, the prophets of God. And in that verse, it, while our typically translations today do not refer to it as anointed, it puts the word prophets in there. Um, the word there in Hebrew is Messiah. And so it's referring to his anointed group, his anointed prophets. <laughs> but if you're over to the Leviticus 4.3 passage, we're going to go ahead and read that. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. Um, here we see, right there in that first line, if the priest that is anointed, the word there in Hebrew is Messiah. So it's not talking about this larger idea of Christ, but it's just referring to this chosen priest, this anointed priest, and off goes on to refer to what you should do in the case that you sin under the law. So we see that very clearly. This word isn't always used in Christ in this instance. But this word isn't even always referred to use as Jewish thought or Jewish ideas or Jewish individuals. Um, turn over with me to Isaiah 45. 1. Here we're going to see that the word is used in reference to, well, one, a non-Jewish individual, and two... Um, someone who ultimately would, in a way, be an enemy against Israel, oddly enough. But it's not, he's even referred to God's anointed in this um, passage. So, Isaiah 45, 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to sires, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Right there in that first line, we see, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. He, that word anointed there yet again is the word Messiah. So we see that this word and this idea of an anointed one isn't always used in reference to Christ or in reference to even individuals under the law. So we see that this being chosen is not always a grander idea of the Messiah, the one to come, the one to establish God's kingdom. So what did the Jews think this Messiah is, and what did they think he was going to do? First things first, as we established in our last study, this Messiah is coming out of the line of David. So that's what the Jews definitely were thinking of, that this would be a king like David. Um, it's often used in reference to David in that line. This starts in 2 Samuel 7.13. Um, in our last study, we read through this passage. I'm just going to give you a brief synopsis real quick. In this passage, David has just asked to build the temple, and God's denied him that right. But that he does make a promise to David that his line's going to be established forever, and that a king is going to come out of this line. And after this point, we see the word Messiah often used in reference to the line or lineage of David. So because of that, the Jews thought the Messiah would be a king to rule over the world. 
and bring the Jewish nation up, and that the Jewish nation through this Messiah is going to rule everything on the, as far as the world's concerned. Uh, we, we see this idea reflected in a couple different Old Testament passages, the first one being Psalm 2. So if you want to turn over there with me, um, I'm going to read the entire thing and make a couple points about this idea of the Messiah ruling the world. So if you want to follow along, uh, if I wanted to point your direct, your eyes somewhere in particular, uh, just look at verse 2 in depth for me while I kind of read through the whole thing. I'm just going to make a couple points about this. So starting in verse 1, I'm going to read all the way through verse 12. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath was kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. This is um, describing the triumph of this king, this Messiah to come. Um, verse 2, it's the word anointed again, the word Messiah. Um, I wanted to point out one thing of this idea of how is this going to be, you know, a Messiah that rules over the earth. Look at verse 8. I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So when they see this, this idea, especially right here in the psalm, they see that this is somehow going to be a, or at least they interpret it to be, we're going to somehow get the earth. We're going to somehow rule everything. That's where Jews get this idea of that, or that the Messiah is going to be a king that's going to help them rule over the earth. Um, another place we see this idea of the Messiah is going to be First Samuel um, chapter 2, uh, two verses there. We're going to look at verse 10 and verse 35. Um, the context of the first verse is, after the Lord has promised Samuel to Hannah, his mother, she goes into this song of praise for the Lord, and she says something very interesting in verse 10. So follow along with me. I'm going to read it real quick. <clears throat> the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces out of heaven, Shall he thunder upon them? The Lord shall give the, the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So as we see here, we see that word anointed again, his anointed. So referring to an individual. And one thing I also want to emphasize: the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth and shall give strength unto his king. So we see this idea: power over the earth, strength unto this individual. Um, now turn over with me it's probably just a if at all a flip a page flip in your Bible um, over to verse 35 context here uh, the prophet Eli uh, this is part of this idea of you know he's going to fall and um, there will be a better priest in his place well in the context it's going to end up being Samuel uh, we see that this also shines to as forward as a anointed priest someone even greater. Uh, so follow with me in verse 35. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. So we see that again, the idea of anointed forever, an eternal king, an eternal kingdom. And so how did the Jews get this idea? I think a lot of this comes from Psalm 2, but we see that the anointed one, this Messiah, is going to establish the Lord's kingdom. But I think the Jews missed the point. Overall, they believe the Messiah was all about establishing a physical kingdom. I, that's not the case. If, you know, as we in our New Testament perspective see that Christ is the Messiah and that his kingdom is not a physical kingdom, 
But when you read passages like Psalm 2 or uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2, verse 10, you can see how the Jews got this idea, but that's not the point. The point is the Messiah is going to come and establish God's kingdom, not a physical kingdom. But so how is Christ this Messiah? How is Christ this anointed one? Well, first, Christ is a transliteration of the Hebrew word Messiah. So where you see the word Christ in your New Testament, it's actually the word Messiah. It's just a Greek way of saying it. The only actual usages of the word Messiah, the Hebrew word, come from John chapter 1 and John chapter 4. We're going to read both these uh, just to kind of see how it's used in the context. Um, so, you just turn over with me. It's going to take me just a sec. Nope. There we go. So the first one is going to be Jesus calling the apostles right at the start of the book of John. Um, we're going to read uh, verse 40 and 41. So I'm starting right there in verse 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So here we see not only the word Messiah being equivalent to the word Christ, but we see the apostles calling Jesus Christ, calling Jesus the Messiah. So this is the first time in the Gospel of John in particular that we see these two terms equated in that we see Christ is this Messiah or at least being called this Messiah. The second is going to be the conversation with the Samaritan woman just a few chapters later. And there's quite the difference here. Um, so start with me in verse 24. We're going to read it all the way through 26. And I think we're going to see something very interesting here. So starting in verse 24. God is the Spirit, and they worship, and they that worship him Let's worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I speak that unto thee, am he. I that speak unto thee, am he. Sorry. So we see here Christ explicitly calls himself this Messiah, this Christ. But how do we see that demonstrated? How do we see that Christ is this Messiah? So this is where those three roles I told you to keep in the back of your mind, king, priest, and prophet, come back into play. So the first one we're going to look at is king. Turn over with me into one of those small minor prophets in the back of your Bible, or back of your Old Testament, uh, that you don't ever read or never refer to all that much. So turn over with me to Zechariah 9. We're going to be reading verse 9. <clears throat> Once you're there, um, I'm going to read verse 9. So I'm just going to go ahead and go read it. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just having salvation, lowly riding upon a donkey, and upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this is talking about the coming king, the coming Messiah. How does Christ fulfill this? The triumphant entry into Jerusalem. In more ways than one. Turn over with me to Luke 19. Now, I want to point out something here. We, did you take note of what animal uh, in Zechariah this king was riding? A donkey. Not even just a donkey, a colt. If you look at Luke 19, when Christ is entering into Jerusalem, the the city mentioned in Zechariah 9. We see something very, very telling of what this Messiah is doing and how Christ is this Messiah. We're going to be re reading verses 29 through 38. So just bear with me and we're going to read the whole thing. But I think it's going to benefit us greatly. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage in Bethany, at the mount called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the, in the which that you are entering, ye shall find a colt 
tide were on yet another <laughs> yet never man sat loose him and bring him hither and if any man ask you why do ye loose him thus shall ye say unto him because the lord hath need of him and they that were sent went their way and found even as he said unto them and they were loosing the colt the owners thereof said why loose ye the colt and they said the lord hath the lord hath need of him and they brought him to jesus and they cast their garments upon the colt and they set jesus thereon and as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So in this part of the triumphant entry, the Messiah, the King, is going to ride in Jerusalem on a colt and is going it's going to I can barely speak sorry um, I think it's it's striking how Zechariah explicitly states that the king is going to ride in Jerusalem on a colt to establish God's kingdom and that as part of the triumphal entry Christ makes a point to ride in on a colt to show that he is this king, the Messiah, and that he's fulfilling the passage in Zechariah 9, that the Messiah is going to come in on a colt, on a donkey. So, but how do we see Christ as a priest? How do we see him as the fulfillment of this anointed priest? Back over to the book of Zechariah. Um, we're, going to be looking, we're, going to, we're going to be looking at Zechariah 3 to start. Then we're going to flip over to Zechariah 6. As soon as I get back over there myself. Sorry, it's taking me just a second. If I can find it, man. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Sorry about the wait, y'all. All right, Zechariah chapter 3. We're going to be reading verse 8. Hear, hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at, for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Now flip over with me to chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses 12 and 13. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And he shall grow up out of this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of the peace shall be between them both. So here we see that the Messiah figure, or here is referred to as the branch, is going to be a mediator between God and his people. In, in a sense, the same role as the king ruling from the temple. So how do we see Christ fulfill this? The Hebrew writer in Hebrews makes this fairly clear. So turn over with me to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be starting in verse, or chapter 5, verse 5, and then going to go to chapter 7. Uh, yep, there we go. So Hebrews 5, just read verse 5, and then go over to chapter 7. Hebrews 5, verse 5 reads, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he, said, he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. So here we see Christ is equated with the high priest. Turn over, now turn over to me chapter 7. We're going to read reading 21 through 25. So starting in verse 21, For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better statement. Testament. Sorry, testament. <clears throat> and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by the reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, 
seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Here we go. In the Old Testament, the high priest, once a year, went to the Holy of Holies to be a mediator, to have intercession with God. Now we see that Christ is forever that high priest to intercede for us with God. He came to earth, lived as a man. Now he intercedes for us. We see that explicitly here in Hebrews. Christ is our high priest. Christ is the chosen priest. But we still have one more role that Christ is supposed to fill. Prophet. How do we see this demonstrated? Prophets or messengers, particularly in scripture, scriptural context, messengers of God. Christ was the messenger of the New Covenant, the New Testament. That's the role he fulfills of a prophet. So we're going to stay right here in the book of Hebrews. And read chapter 9, verse 15. <clears throat> and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, by that means of death, for the redemption of transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise eternal inheritance. So we see that he's the mediator of the new covenant. He's the deliverer, the messenger of this covenant right here in Hebrews 9.15. So we see through Christ's preaching on earth, Jesus often quoted Old Testament prophets showing that he was continuing this message. Because we see right there in Hebrews 9.15, it all kind of runs together as a continuation that pre Jesus is preaching the same message as the prophets before. It's just he's fulfilling all of it at the same time. So we're just going to demonstrate this fulfillment, this Jesus quoting the Old Testament prophets. So turn over to me, Matthew chapter 9, in verse 13. So 9, verse 13. But ye go, learn what that meaneth, I will have mercy, and not sacrifice, for I am not, not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 9.13, this is after the calling of Matthew, but we're going to flip over to Hosea 6.6 6 and see how this is actually a quote of an Old Testament prophet. So, sorry, it's taking me some time to get to Hosea too. I got a bunch of one page. Here we go. Finally got there. Uh, Hosea chapter 6. We're going to be reading verse 6. <clears throat> For I desired mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God that burnt more... Knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So this is a quote. Matthew chapter 9 verse 13 quotes the, that passage. Um, so they're just quoting each other, but this is all to show that Jesus is continuing this preaching, this idea of delivering the message of God. So Christ is the anointed one, is the Messiah. He fulfills all three of the roles, the different, the different ideas, the different people, the different kinds of roles that were chosen for him to be anointed. He fulfills all three. And he is this Messiah, this king, this priest, this prophet. He is all three. But... What does he rule over? Who did he preach to? Who did he intercede for? That's us. He preached unto us. He rules over us. And he taught us the gospel. A message for all of us to attain and to hopefully one day use to get to heaven with our Lord and Savior. So we never want to end a study without an invitation um, to respond to this gospel. Um, if you've already responded to the gospel and would need some help in your walk or need to make confession, we encourage you to get in contact with us. If you've never been baptized, if you've never responded to the gospel, we also encourage you to please come and get in contact with us. Uh, use the information here on this slide. Please get in contact with one of your elders if you need to, and we would love to help you in your walk. Um, thank you for listening today. Uh, I hope you've gained something from this study. I know I have uh, in my time putting it together. Uh, we thank you, and please go look at the rest of the studies on our page. Thank you.